too long, but I hope that you enjoyed your uh, Christmas period and New Year period and that you feasted well, that you rested well. Uh, if you haven't met me before, if it is your first time, my name's Aaron, uh, I'm one of the elders. It's a privilege to welcome you on this first Sunday together of 2018. Um, I want to say a personal thank you to uh, all of you for um, praying for Megan and I and our family, the, the girls, as we, over the Christmas period, I know many of you prayed for us, we had a really restful time while we were away, and I want to say thank you for the generosity as well that was displayed, particularly to the girls, it was, it was a bit overwhelming to be honest, um, but genuinely moved by your affection for us as a family, so thank you for that, um, they received quite a few presents, um, and so yeah, really very grateful for that, thank you so much. Um, in case you haven't heard it this week, or perhaps even this year yet, I want you to know that I love you. I said that last time, I'm, I'm, that's fine, I'm not asking you to say it back to me, you're all allowed to do, I love hearing it, but I just want you to know I love you genuinely, I'm praying for you, um, and even if if, it's, if you're a regular member, I'm praying for you, know that, that's that's. Uh, that is true. If you've never been with us before, and you've never met me before, it's still generally true that I'm praying for you. I pray for you to be here this morning. Not specifically my name, but I pray that God would bring you here this morning in order that he could speak to you, hopefully, through me. But more important than me loving you, I think that's hopefully quite important, uh, as one of your elders, that I love you, but God loves you. You need to know, start this year knowing that God loves you. As a human being, you are the glorious pinnacle of his creation. You are made in his image and likeness. You have a value and dignity that is wonderful to behold. So I don't know how you started the year, but I want you to know, as of today, start like that. You've got dignity and worth that's wonderful to behold. This morning, I just want to set out a, a kind of tra rough trajectory of where we're going to head this year. Um, but before that, I just want to share a few brief, very brief reflections on 2017, and then we'll look at a, a trajectory of where we're potentially and hopefully headed this year. Um, there were lots of changes in 2017, quite, quite a few towards the end. Uh, physical change of location. Uh, I suppose uh, change in the branding of the church, the, the sort of design of stuff, which is representative of a change of mindset, really, a change of a slight change of a tweak of identity of we're, we're becoming who we actually are. And so I know sometimes that's difficult. Change for some people is is like death. The, the old thing has died in order for the new thing to come, and it's, it can be it can be tricky. Can't it? Some people love change. It's like yes. The old is gone, the new is come, fantastic, which um, is okay. But for some of us, it probably was quite difficult to move locations. It's quite difficult to see, sort of, oh, I quite like that logo. Well, that, that said something about us that I, I quite liked. And so those things are just representative, really. But I know for many of us, it was a difficult year, 2017. There were lots of challenging things that took place, lots of battles that were fought throughout the year some of which are, are still going on. But what's great about last year, and the last few years really in particular, is that we've been brought as a church to a, a place of stability and strength. And we're, we're on, standing on solid ground in terms of where we are. We're in a healthy place as a church. And I'm not saying we're standing firm and oh, we're over proud or overconfident, but we're in a good place to go, God, what can we do for you? We're, we're, we're sort of crouched down, ready to, to take a leap for God. We're in a place where we can see, we can expect to see great things from God. The danger of that is that we're in a place where we could go, <coughs> everything's kind of okay. Some new members added today, fantastic. See a few more, see ones and twos over the year, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll settle for that. Some people go, some people come. We'll settle for that. We could settle where we are. Finances of the church, yeah, okay, pretty stable. Sustaining, healthy. 
could settle for that. In my life, personally, um, I kind of get to talk to some people about Jesus. So I sort of, I'm, I'm working up to it. <coughs> could settle for that. I, I'm kind of doing my bit. Or, I, I know that's not the half people in this church, right? Or we can be, yes, yeah, so what are you going to do? We're here. We're, we, we feel secure enough to go, come on, God. What are we doing? Where are we going? And so this year is very much going to be about, God, where do you want us to go? Let's go. What do you want us to do? Let's do it. So be ready to be mobilised. We're called to more than just existing. Jesus didn't say, I will maintain my church. He said, I will build my church. We're not to go into maintenance mode because things are comfortable. I felt a kind of prophetic challenge for us as a church through the words of a Christmas song. Uh, so if it's not too early in January to remind you of a Christmas song, uh, it's these particular words. Joy to the world, let every heart prepare him room. I just felt God say to me through those words, all through the Christmas period, let every heart prepare him room. We need to start preparing ourselves to go, God, what, what is it in my life that you want to change or that you want to lay hold of? Prepare him room. Now, it doesn't mean just in your emotions, but it means in your entire life. Prepare him room. Our trajectory for this year, then, has three main elements to it. And we, obviously, we're in January, in case you were still right in December 2017, as I have written 2017 a few times on bits of paper. Um, this is the trajectory of the year that we as elders, we've prayed about, we've, we've sought God, we've discussed and planned. We, we think this is where we think God is taking us this year. This is, it's January. By December, some of this may have changed because God leads this church. And if he says, actually, you thought you were doing this, I've got this over here for you. We're open to that as elders. We want to plan well and then respond to God well. That's a, this is the trajectory of where we think we're headed. We've prayerfully considered it. We, we think this is what God is saying. But just to say, if it changes, it's not like, oh, isn't that terrible? We didn't do what we meant to do. It's God will have changed it. In faith, this is the trajectory that we believe God has given us for the coming year. I've expressed it like this, which hopefully will be helpful to you by the uh, end of today. But we're in this place, we're in this town to bring glory to God and do some great things, for, see God do some great things. So our trajectory is this. Thalassophobia, upside down and inside out. You might not have heard the word thalassophobia before. Um, but I only very recently came across it, but it's, it's very interesting. Uh, you potentially have it, um, as most people have some mild form of it. But has anyone seen Blue Planet? Blue Planet 2, I should say. Things like this. Um, amazing, right? Like, you watch it. Uh, no spoilers, please, because we're only part way through. Um, not that you can really spoil it, but um, amazing. Just watch this stuff and you go, fish has got like a no like head it just looks up through its own head that's crazy um or this whale shark this is a human being um who's measuring it with a laser um apparently but that's huge this thing um thalassophobia is the fear a fear of the sea or deep water um I've always loved swimming. I love it. I, and specifically, I love being underwater. There's something about it, I don't know what it is, but I love being underwater. Um, and a few years ago, if you said to me, you've got the chance to go and do this, you can, you can be the guy who does the measuring, or you can swim alongside the whale truck. I'd, yeah, man, I'm well up for that. I'd love it. Um, but recently, when I watch things like this, or I see pictures like this, there's something in me that goes, oh, I feel a bit panicked. I feel a bit, a bit fearful. 
Now, not, not I'm not you know having an anxiety attack or anything like that, but there's something in me that feels physically uncomfortable. Um, and it's not it's not a genuine fear, as I say, but there's something a tangible sense of being a bit freaked out whenever someone is near one of these huge animals. Um, there's a clip of a, a humpback whale coming out of the water and splashing down onto a kayak with two people on it. I was watching, I was thinking, oh my goodness, that's, that maybe that's the sort of origin of my fear. But um, things like this, hopefully this video will work. Uh, we'll see. Okay, there's no sound on this, so don't worry. Like that, when I watched that, I was thinking, I did work on that, okay, right. It's basically a, a, a kind of, I can't remember the type of shark it is, but it's got a huge mouth and it's sort of swimming towards this person who is on top of the water filming the fin. And it's like, oh, I'll just take a look at what this is. Underneath is this huge animal. And when I watched that, I was like, man, that <laughs> makes me feel nervous, even though I'm not actually there. Um, but I thought God was speaking to me through this. It wasn't just a weird. Um, a weird thing about me, of which there are many. Um, I felt God was speaking to me through this. He's saying, your concept of me, your concept of who Jesus is, is too small. Actually, when you get out into the deep water, there's something in you that should feel a bit, oh, I, I, I feel a bit nervous about this. I'm a bit, oh, I, I hope he's good because this is, he's really big and powerful, so I hope he's good because otherwise I'm probably in trouble. I hope I'm right before God. I'm a bit nervous about this. So this idea of being out in the deep water, where you there's a point in the sea where you can't see land anywhere. You're the fur, it's the furthest point from uh, land. Where if you're there, and people go there for boating things and stuff. If you're there, you're actually closer to the people in the the space station orbiting the Earth than you are to people on land. There's a point in the sea like that, which to me I'm just thinking, oh my goodness, the closest people to help are astronauts. This, you know, <laughs> actually, we need to put out into the deep waters of Jesus. We need to put out into the deep waters of God to the point where actually it's going to stretch us and we're going to, we're going to feel a little bit uncomfortable and go, oh, I knew he was holy, but I didn't know that, what that really meant. I knew he was good, but I didn't know what that meant. I knew he loved me, I didn't realise how much. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And as I was uh, praying about this morning, uh, and talking to Andy and Dan, I had this, was reminded of this game show. <sighs> We're using the big projector for the first time, and it's playing up. In case you can't see it, so you can see from over there, this game show, catchphrase, and there was always the key catchphrase at the end, where each round you took away one block, and then you had to guess this one, and you got the, the extra prize. Um, but the point being, what we're going to be doing for the first 14-ish weeks of this year, so the next 14 weeks, is removing blocks so that each week we're getting a clearer picture of who Jesus is, a, a bigger picture of who Jesus is. God's prompt was to challenge me to get a bigger, clearer view of Jesus, to push out into the deeper waters where things start to get a little bit uncomfortable. And so we're going to begin this year by looking at Jesus through the, the Gospel of John. We're going to be saying, He is. And then looking at all the different things that Jesus is through that lens of John's Gospel. <clears throat> and so we're going to come back to this a little bit later this morning. But I want to begin by reading a small section from this book, which I would recommend to you. Uh, it's called Seeing and Savouring Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read a short section from it just to hopefully whet your appetite in terms of <clears throat> stretching your view of Jesus. Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last. 
Jesus Christ, the person, never had a beginning. He is absolute reality. He had the unparalleled honour and unique glory of being there first and always. He never came into being. He was eternally begotten. The Father has eternally enjoyed the, enjoyed the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature in the person of his Son. Seeing and savouring this glory is the goal of our salvation. Jesus in his high priestly prayer said this, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me. To feast on this forever is the aim of our being created and of our being redeemed. He's bigger than we think. He's more magnificent than we think. I knew, I knew he was there in the beginning, but he's eternal. How, how often do we contemplate him? Our goal is to see Christ more and to enjoy him by seeing him more. And as we do, we move into the deep waters where it can feel a little uncomfortable, but there's joy in that because in that moment where we think, oh, I hope he's good, I really hope he's good because he's powerful, he's, he's better than we can possibly imagine. He's more good, that's bad English, he's more good than we can possibly imagine. And it should produce in us this cycle of worship that produces uh, praise-fueled transformation in our lives. That as we see him more, we go, oh, he's so big and I'm so small. But he loves me and he's with me. And so I, oh, I can praise him. He's so holy and I'm so unholy. I'm so sinful. But he loves me. He's made me righteous through his son. I can't live that way anymore. He's so mighty. I'm so weak. But he loves me and he's given me the strength to follow him. He's not putting demands on me that he's not going to help me to meet. There should be these cycles of worship that we see something of God, compare it to ourselves, realise how short we fall, but then see that he's made up that lack in his son and he's given us the Holy Spirit. And that should promote worship. We oh, worship you, God. I want to live differently. I want to follow you more. And so we talk about the, the 320s in this church. Every time we do a kind of looking forward Sunday, a vision Sunday or so, this is where we're headed. We talk about 20 minutes a day with God, 20 pounds uh, more a month giving, and 20 people that we're extending hope to. So I want to talk, say 20 minutes a day in worship, 20 minutes a day in the presence of God. It's not difficult when we start looking at Jesus like this. When we start thinking, oh, Jesus, tell me a bit more through your word, through speaking to me through the Holy Spirit. Tell me a bit more about how holy you are. Let me learn more about your holiness. Then worshipping him, 20 minutes, we can fill that time very quickly. These cycles of worship work themselves out, not just in the singing of songs together, but in living our everyday lives to honour God in the strength that is given to us by him. For his glory and our joy. You okay? Good. That's thalassophobia, which you can forget that word if you want. Just think about pushing out into the deep waters of who Jesus is, growing and stretching our understanding. The second point is the upside down. This is uh, sort of the logo, slightly even a tweet of a show called Stranger Things, which is. Uh, Interesting if you've ever seen it, um, but it's in this show. There's this idea that there's a, a parallel world, one which in which we live, and then another one which is uh, where everything's kind of rotten and not so good, and it's called the upside down. And you see, the world around us is changing, and it's changing quickly. 
But what's happened in the last three years in terms of where what's acceptable in culture is the equivalent of what's happened in the last sort of preceding 20 years. Things are changing and they're changing more quickly. And we need to be better equipped to live in a way that is true to the gospel, true to the teaching of the Bible, but not cut off from the world around us. We need to know how to live the reality of the gospel in a country and in a world that is increasingly hostile to the gospel and to those that follow it. It's not a bad thing necessarily that the world is becoming more and more different to how the church should be. Because the more different the church is, the more attractive it will be. We need to know how to live in the upside down. The truth is, this has always been the reality for the church. The church has never been, never meant to live the way that the world was meant to live. And I think because we live in a Western culture and actually we've enjoyed historically a, a wonderful period where lots of the morality of society and culture around us and the church sort of were in step. It was like, okay, this is this is good, and it was good, but actually now that's, that's very much not the case. And so we need to learn how to live in the upside down. Philippians 2, uh, verse 12 to 16, say this, verse 15 to 16 are up there. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, stars in the sky, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labour in vain. among whom you shine as lights in the world. We're supposed to be different to the world. We're not supposed to be the same. Christians are meant to be different. We're meant to stand out. In the same way that when you look at the night sky, there's lots of sky and you see a, a light from a star, it stands out. It's not the same as the rest of the sky. We're meant to stand out. We're meant to be different. And so we want to look at some things that are going to help us to be equipped to do that. I'm going to read a, another section from 1 Peter 3. This is 1 Peter 3, verses uh, 13 to 17. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous? Who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honour Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behaviour in Christ may be put to shame. For it's better to suffer for doing good, if that be God's will, than for doing evil. I want to be honest with you and open with you, Potentially, what's going to happen is the church will become under close scrutiny, not just our church, but churches that stay true to the teaching of the Bible are going to come under increased scrutiny. And you may well suffer for the gospel if you're going to hold true to what the Bible says. That's not unusual. It's unusual for us. It's not unusual in the history of the church. Sounds like some children are suffering. <laughs> It's not unusual in the history of the church. And we need to be ready for it. We need to be prepared for it. So that when we wake up and stub our toe, we don't think, oh, that's, I'm being persecuted. That's not persecution. We need to be ready to experience hostility towards us. We're not under attack because we've stubbed our toe. We're under attack when there's pressure on us. You need, to, you need to change this or you're going to lose your job. You need to, you can't say that, you're going to go to jail. You can't say that, we'll close you down. 
we need to be ready to stand up for those things, to stand up to those things. In a way that's gentle and respectful, where we've got good conscious, conscience, can't say that word, so that when people go, look at them, they're, they're so bigoted and horrid and terrible and they're, they're not friendly to anyone, actually what happens is people go, you know, I went there and they were lovely. But they disagreed with me, but they were so respectful and gentle in the way that they did it, I felt so loved. That's how we need to be. And so, after we've spent some time looking at who Jesus is and stretching, stretching our understanding of that, that helps us to do that when we look at how he did it. God became a man. He lived in a, in a world that was completely different. Um, and he was dealing with people, how he did that. But how Jesus, an eternal member of the Trinity, became a baby, it was very different for him. That's going to be an element of that first series that we're going to be looking at. But we're also going to be looking at and doing some teaching on what the Bible says about some of the controversial issues of today and things that would be considered strange things by those around us. People will go, don't really follow what the Bible says, do you? That's like, you know, that's a really old book. How, how does that have any relevance on your, you know, it's not, it doesn't tell you how to use your phone, does it? You know? We're going to talk about those things and in fact we need to be, know what we're standing on, we need to be rooted in those things. So that when someone says, well, why does that old book influence your life? You go, well, because I know it's the inspired word of God. I know it. And this is why. We have to give an account for the hope that we have. So we're going to do that. We're going to look at those controversial issues and equip ourselves to be able to deal with them. And then across the summer, we're going to look at how we live out the values that we hold as a church. How do we practically demonstrate those things? We, we believe in these things. We say that these things are good. We think they're the right things to pursue. How do we live them out in a way that demonstrates the love of God to the world? One of the ways we do that is by giving. As a, as a church, we encourage people, if you're a member of this church, you should give financially to the work of the church and to supporting other people within the body. And so the second of our 2020-20 challenge um, is, can we give each of us £20 more a month? Can we, can we stretch to that between now and September 2020? And I know particularly tricky to maybe talk about that after Christmas, but we're not going to shy away from talking about money in this church because money is one of the key things that will try and replace God as first in your life. And as we give financially, we say, God is my God, not money. Now maybe you feel like, oh, don't talk about money now, it's after Christmas, and it's uh, not a good time. But actually, maybe that's a time for some like, serious reflection. How, how do I get myself into this situation? I spent too much money at Christmas. Well, no, that's the amount I budgeted to spend, but I didn't have it saved. Well, think about how you can do that over the year, how you can uh, manage your finances well. It's important to know that we're meant to be different. You need to know that we're, we're meant to be different. And that as we look at Jesus and our understanding of who he is grows, and what he's done grows as it stretches, it causes us to live differently. As, you, as we're in his presence, we're like, oh God, well, I've got some understanding of who you are. I definitely can't do that anymore. Well, I'm not, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to follow you more closely. It causes us to live differently. Or not even, I'm not going to do that, but I am going to do this. This is what Jesus did. This is, he was so loving to people. Well, I'm going to be like that. The people that no one really wanted to talk to, well, I'm going to be like that. I'm going to sit with the person that no one wants to talk to at work and talk to them. The person who may be, you know, I don't know, they've got some issue that no one really wants to be with them. Then as we live differently as individuals and as a church, as we are known as different, it impacts the community that we're a part of. It would impact the community that's around us here, the community that's around you at work or uh, your social group. It will impact the community that we're a part of in this town of Watford. <coughs> 
this year will be a year of community impact. The community in this room, oh, this is living differently still. When I was a kid, these things were really popular, like this sort of, this idea of an image, you know, fish swimming and then one fish going the other way, like go against the flow, like really sort of 80s Christian, um, luminous colours. Um, and then in the 90s, I think people realised, yeah, that's really not cool. Um, why being called is important, I don't know. Um, but this idea, I knew, as a kid growing up, because I saw these sorts of things, I knew I was meant to be different. So when my friends at school said, oh, we're going to do this, and my parents said, oh, well, you, you're not going to do that. Um, and I was like, okay. And I knew why, because I'm meant to be different. Because I'm following Jesus, I'm meant to be different. I'm, it's meant to be a bit like awkward, like, oh, you're all, you know, going off and doing whatever. Well, I'm not doing that because I know it's not right. Yeah, but sorry, I'm different. I knew it. I knew. Um, so know that you're meant to be different. It's important. Be different, not weird. Sometimes they're very different. Um, if you're a weird person, carry on being weird, but don't deliberately be weird for the sake of it. Um, Inside Out, nothing to do with the film, but that says those words. This will be a year of community impact. The community in this room will be impacted. You know, look around, there will be more people by the end of this year. The community outside these walls will be impacted prayerfully by us being here. Otherwise, we're a bit of a parasite leeching and someone else could be using this room. Across this town, we should see the gospel impacting. And so, in the autumn, we're going to be doing a, our campaign phase will be about building community. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to do any kind of stuff that will impact the community until the autumn. We're not going, no, no, that sounds like it'd be great. Can you just wait until September to do that? Because we're not doing that now. This whole year, we're looking for things to go, how can we impact the community? So if you've got an idea, you think, X1 Act is great. But I'd like to do a soup kitchen type thing or go and serve the guys that are playing football out there some hot soup to the, the parents that are watching when it gets cold. That's great. We want to hear those ideas. We want to say, yes, go for it. But in particular, we'll be focusing on this community impact and building community in the autumn term. Galatians 6 uh, verses 9 and 10 says, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Something I felt quite um, challenged by is how well we look after one another. I think we do an okay job, but actually I think... Sometimes I hear about someone who's having a tough time and I think, oh, I probably could have done a bit more there. Or I know someone who could have helped them out. So I want to encourage us, let's, let's do good to everyone, especially those who are in the household of faith, especially to those who are our brothers and sisters. And one of the key ways that we do that is a detail in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. It says this, what then, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, uh, a tongue or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. So I want to lay before you a challenge as one of your elders and say, when you come to Sunday mornings, as much as you possibly can, and I know some of us, sometimes, some weeks, it's like all you can do to drag your corpse to this building. I know, I'm aware that's the reality. I'm, you know, we're not going to pretend that everyone's coming in here, way great to see you, like happy. But as much as you possibly can, let's come together. There's something to bring and go, I want to encourage the church. This is what God has done for me this week. This is, I read this and God spoke to me about this. 
God spoke to me about boldness. And the next day, I took a chance and I spoke to my co-worker. And they, were, they said, oh, that's really interesting. They didn't say, God, you're a lunatic. You know, they said, oh, that's interesting. I'd like to know more. And we're going to have another conversation over lunch next week. Let's encourage one another. Let's build one another up. So I want to lay a challenge on you, on us, to say, how are you coming on Sunday mornings? Are you coming ready to... I've been praying, I'm, I'm amped, I'm, I've been worshipping God. Hey, come on, it's 10.30, why are we still waiting? Let's get going. Let's come together like that. As we're changed into Christ's image by looking at him, as we live differently, we're able to extend the hope that we have to those around us those both in the church and outside of the church. We're to do good to all. We are to come to Sunday mornings and small groups prepared and ready to build each other up. If you're not part of an explore group, obviously I know we're in a course term, but you're still associated with an explore group, the chances are you're probably on a WhatsApp group or you've got a, you know, there's a list somewhere of your group. Why not? One day a week, take that list and just pray for all of those people. It doesn't have to be a big, long, half an hour prayer for each person. Just as you get up, stick it on your mirror or your fridge or wherever. Lord, I pray you bless these people this, this, today. You don't have to do it every day, but just even just, I'm just going to fire through those names. Bless them. Pray they have a good day. Pray that work's really good. Pray that their children are good. Pray that they have you know, a meaningful conversation with someone. It's an easy thing to do. It's building each other up. It's powerful to say, I've been praying for you. When I know this, a uh, lady called Diana Chesbrough, who's part of the church, who hasn't been able to come for health reasons. I, throughout my life, I know she's prayed for me pretty much every day that she's known me, which is most of my life. I know she's, because someone else told me, oh, you know, I've, I've been praying with Diana, she always prays for you. Let's build one another up. And then as we move back into campaign mode in the autumn, we'll be focusing on those different aspects. What does it mean to, to build community? What does it mean to be a church that's building community both within the church family and across the town we're serving God in? And the final one of our 2020 challenges, we couldn't quite get it down to 2020, um, is who are you extending hope to? Can you extend hope to 20 people? And there are 20 people that you can go, this is the hope I've got, have some of it. They don't have to all be outside of the church, they can be people in the church and outside of the church. Our aim or trajectory this year is to enlarge our view of God, expand our knowledge, deepen our understanding, increase our affection and grow in our relationship with Jesus. Because as we do that, as we behold the glory of the Lord, they just saw in that communion. Uh, as we behold the glory of the Lord, we're transformed more and more and more, one degree by another, into his likeness. And then as we know him more, as we become more like him, we reflect his goodness and his glory to those around us. And what the world needs now is not more progression, more liberal progression. What the world needs is the good news of Jesus on display through the church. The good news, there's not just a better life, but the true and better life is found only in Jesus. It's not a better life necessarily in terms of material possessions, but it's a better way to experience joy and delight. A better way to express your freedom and individuality. A better way to demonstrate and receive love and forgiveness and affection. I want to finish by reading another slightly adapted quote uh, from a guy called George Whitfield, who you may know. And then we're going to sing a song and take communion together. Um, as this beginning, let's just stretch our understanding of who Jesus is. Let's, 
expand our view. Let's deepen our affection. And this is uh, taken from a, a talk called Christ the Best Husband, uh, which was preached to uh, a group of young women. He was invited to talk at this young woman's thing. So he preached this to these young women who were potentially looking for a husband. So that's the context, uh, if there's sort of that kind of language in it. The church is the bride of Christ. Jesus, we're waiting for our husband, Jesus, and that's not a, a weird thing. It's, a, it's meant to be a picture of the affection and the love that Jesus has for the church, and the church should have that sort of excited anticipation. The groom is coming. He's going to be here. So this is this, this Christ the best husband. George Whitfield said this, Consider who the Lord Jesus is. Whom you are invited to join yourselves to. He is the best husband. There is none comparable to Jesus Christ. Do you desire one that is great? He is of the highest dignity. He is the glory of heaven, the delight of eternity, admired by angels, dreaded by de devils, and adored by saints. For you to be joined to so great a king, what honour will you have by this union? Do you desire one that is rich? None is comparable to Christ. The fullness of the earth belongs to him. If you be espoused or joined to Christ, you shall share in his unsearchable riches. You shall receive of his fullness, even grace for grace here. And you shall hereafter be admitted to glory and shall live with this Jesus for all eternity. Do you desire one that is wise? There is none comparable to Christ for wisdom. His knowledge is infinite, infinite, and his wisdom is equal to that. If you are joined to Christ, he will guide and counsel you and make you wise for salvation. Do you desire one that is potent and strong, who may defend you against your enemies and all the insults and reproaches of the Pharisees of this generation? There is none that can equal Christ in power. There is none that can equal Christ in power. For the Lord Jesus Christ has all power. Do you desire one that is good? There is none like Christ in this regard. Others may have some goodness, but it's imperfect. Christ's goodness is complete and perfect. He is full of goodness, and in him dwells no evil. Do you desire one that is beautiful? His eyes are most sparkling, his smiles are most delightful and refreshing to the soul. Christ is the most lovely person of all the others in the world. Do you desire one that can love you? None can love you like Christ. His love, my dear sisters and brothers, is incomprehensible. His love passes all other loves. The love of the Lord Jesus is first. Without beginning, his love is free without any motive. His love is great without any measure. His love is constant without any change. His love is everlasting. Joy to the world. Let every heart prepare him room.